So hello and welcome to PT exams prep six things you need to know to pass the written exam. <coughs> I have a bit of a cough today so I apologize that I will be uh, coughing here and there but I'm really excited today to share with you the six things or some major th six things I think you need to know to pass the exam. Uh, so we're going to get right into it. This should take us about 40 minutes, um, potentially um, 35, but we're going to see what we can do and we will answer questions throughout, but definitely answer any questions at the end, okay? Um, if you do have any questions, you'll notice that I have you all on mute and I had do this because we have a little bit of a larger group, <clears throat> so I just want to make sure that there's not too much echoing. <coughs> If you do have a question, just post it in the chat. I will do my best to kind of keep poking back and looking in the chat box. All right. So first off, who am I? So my name is Caitlin Proctor, and I am the founder of PT Exam Prep. I am a Canadian-trained physiotherapist, uh, and I work in orthopedics. So I work in um, a private practice or orthopedics, um, but I also, of course, do PT Exam Prep. And this is my love, my passion, uh, you know, where I spend most of my time. Um, and that's really just educating students to pass the written and practical exam. So I'd like to get to know you a little bit. I know where you're from, which is great, um, but I just want to know a little bit more about your history as far as um, physiotherapy. So my first question, you're going to see it launch up onto your screen here. It's how long has it been since you graduated from a physical therapy program? Just looking for one more person there. Okay, about 10 more seconds. Put your answer in if possible. Okay, so I'm going to close that poll. So if we take a look here, it looks like most of you guys are zero to two years, which is great. I love this. Um, we have two to four years is next, and no one is five to ten or over ten. So that's perfect. You are already ahead of the curve in that you are still fresh into the studying world. So as you start studying, it's really not going to be too far from your memory of the things that you need to know. So, awesome. Next thing I want to know um, is how many times have you wrote the written exam? Uh, if this is your first attempt, then you can type that. Uh, other than that, we'll go one, two, three, four. I don't think we'll have any fours out there, but we'll, we'll take a look. Perfect. Okay. So waiting for one more vote again, but that person just might be um, non-responsive. I'm just going to take a look. Oh, it looks like we do. Okay, we have one person who's not saying too much there. All right, so I'm going to close, share that with you. So most of you, this will be your first attempt. We have a, a first, um, they have, they've done it once, and then they've done it twice. Okay, so you know, those people who said, or I guess that, the two people that said that they have done it um, twice, you definitely want to stick around and kind of chat a little bit more about courses. You're in a, a tough spot with that uh, because your, your next attempt will be your last attempt. Um, so we need to make sure that you are as prepared as possible. Um, for the people who this is their first attempt, that's awesome. That's a really great place to be at. Uh, employers love to see that you've passed on your first attempt. It also means that you get to practice sooner, so you get to go out into the physio world and make money um, and you get to of course do the practical uh, exam twice a year so it really opens up your opportunity for where you, when you can write. Okay, so last one here, my question for you, and this is more just for my personal knowledge, are you currently enrolled in a course? <clears throat> now I recognize uh, a few names out there which is good. Okay, so I'm going to close this, take a look. So it looks like we have the majority of you that are no, you're not enrolled in a course. Um, but we do have a few that are yes with PT exam prep. So that's awesome. I recognize your guys' names, so I might pick on you a little bit. Um, and most definitely the people who are in our course uh, and when I'm asking questions, uh, I'm going to expect you guys to get those questions right and um, be sure to be answering the questions in the chat right as well because uh, that's what we come to expect of people who have taken the course. So 
let's keep going. So my very first point for everyone here is study with an intention. So what that means is I want you to really set aside good time to study. So I'm talking about quality, not quantity. A question that I get asked all the time is how many hours should I be studying a day? Now, it's impossible for me to answer that. Some people are born geniuses and other people are just, they take a little bit more time to grasp topics. So it really depends on how prepared you are or how effective you are when you study. So the quality is really what you're looking for rather than saying, you know, four or five hours. Um, you just need to be making sure that you're memorizing and understanding the content. So how do you do that? First, set up a study space. Try to go into the same spot and study every single time. So if you have an area in your bedroom or in an office, perfect. A kitchen table, you know, maybe that's good, but if you have a family and stuff going around uh, as you're studying, definitely not the most ideal situation. Um, but try to go to that same spot every time, even if it's something like a library or a coffee shop. Go to the same spot. When we look at effective study habits, we actually find that people who go to the same spot to study are more effective when they study. Okay. The next is get good sleep and exercise. And of course, this is kind of um, an obvious thing uh, for people who are studying for physio. We know the effects of good sleep and exercise. But the thing that I kind of like to intertwine within this is a really interesting research study that showed that if you take a complicated um, subject, so for me, a complicated subject is VQ matching and postural drainage positions. Difficult for me. I just have a very hard time memorizing those, those positions, whether it's because I just don't use them or not, but what the study said is if you study that hard material and then go for a walk or get some exercise, you actually have better comprehension and retention. So you memorize it better. Same thing if you can take a nap and go on a nap is a tough one. A nap is about 15 minutes, not an hour, not two hours, not a sleep, uh, less than 20 minutes, so about 15 minutes, and that actually has shown to consolidate information better too. <clears throat> Again, there is research to show that studying to classical music can also help you with memory and retention. Um, so put on some Beethoven, and get it in your headphones, and listen away. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the music aspect later because, of course, you can't have music in the exam. Um, but it is a nice way uh, as you're putting in those you know, hundreds of hours of studying. Um, the next thing I like to do is something called Eat the Frog. Uh, it sounds a little strange, but the idea behind Eat the Frog is if you were to make a list of the most difficult things to do in your day, uh, you would mark the most difficult as the frog. And you would eat the frog or do whatever that hardest activity is at the very beginning of your day. And that way, you have the confidence and the momentum to say, I've already finished this, now the rest of my day is easy. So, tomorrow, when you start studying and you have your agenda things to study, try to starve, you know, put your little frog beside the one thing that you are just not looking forward to do. And eat it. Get it done with. Do it first thing. And see how the rest of your day is productivity-wise. Um, make sure you don't understand, don't just memorize. Now this is really, really important, okay? And the reason for that is anyone can memorize, but it really takes a true learner and a, a true successful physio writer to understand. Okay. Make up questions. Questions are a great way to practice. And don't make up questions that are single answer or easy multiple choice questions. Make up tough vignette style questions where you have four answers, A through D, and maybe A or D or C or B or whatever you want, but make two of them really close, but just enough different that there is a clear, correct, and incorrect answer. Okay. I want to practice. I'm going to give you guys a question here. So I'm going to give you guys one minute to work on this, okay? Okay, that's 30 seconds. You get 30 more seconds to answer.
Okay, it looks like everyone's answered, so I'm going to close. So, if I take a look at these answers here, unfortunately they will not be shared on your screen due to uh, privacy. We just want to make sure that we're um, respecting everyone. If you didn't get it right, we don't want to share that. Uh, but it looks like 60% of you got the answer right. And so which trunk does the ulnar nerve come from? The answer is inferior, okay? So we are going to talk a little bit about point number two. <clears throat> So point number two, no more than just basic anatomy. So what I just asked you is what we consider to be a level one question, a basic anatomy question, okay? So there are a few things that I really want to make sure I get across to you guys, and that's really understanding the difference between a basic question and a more complex question, okay? So if we take a look at something like the suprascapular nerve, and I were to say which trunk does it come off of? I want you guys to be able to easily say the upper trunk. If I were to ask you of the trajectory of the suprascapular nerve, a little bit more level two, I'd want you to say it runs along the superior border of the scapula and passes through the superior suprascapular notch. All right. Now, that's all good and dandy, but I want you also to know what muscles it innervates which are, and there's a mistake here, but it should be infraspinatus and supraspinatus muscle. So again, all level two questions there. Where I would go and say a level three question is, or a tougher level three question would be, is if I said there was a lesion along the superior border of the scapula, which muscles are affected? Now from that question, you need to know that a lesion along the superior border of the scapula would likely affect the suprascapular nerve, which innervates the infraspinatus and supraspinatus. So taking that knowledge of basic anatomy and integrating in order to get that final answer. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So, sorry, my screen just went there. Awesome. Okay, so if we go to the brachial plexus chart, we can take a look at some good information here. Uh, so the brachial plexus chart is going to show us um, everything that you need to know about memorizing your nerves and their innervations. So this is something that we absolutely get our students to memorize, okay? I want you to use this chart to break down the nerve roots into trunks, division cords, terminal branches, and you should know all of them. Right? So, for example, when I asked you which trunk does the ulnar nerve come off of, if we take a look here and we look at the top and see superior, middle, and inferior, we can look all the way over in inferior and say that it gives off to the ulnar nerve, which is how you should answer that question. So, we're going to give you one other question here to look at. Again, I'll give you one minute. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to close that. We're going to take a look at your results. <clears throat> so only two people got that right, and I'm just going to check. Okay, good. So, sorry, me being a little bit wanting to make sure that uh, our core students got it right. So good, you did get it right, Leela, awesome. Um, but for the answer to this question, it says what nerve branches from the posterior cord? So if we take a look, the answer was all of the above. So let's go to that posterior cord and take a bigger look. So if we look at the posterior cord here, I want everyone to go and find it, so it's off of that middle trunk. We should be able to see that there is the upper subscapular, the rachodorsal, lower subscapular, axillary, and radial. Now, one of the mnemonics that we teach our students is to use the mnemonic STAR for the posterior cord. So, if we take a look at this, you will see uh, the posterior branches are S, subscapular, upper and lower, 
T, thoracodorsal, A, auxiliary, and R, radial, star. A good way to memorize the branches. <clears throat> we can then take a look at um, mnemonics for the lateral or the medial cord, but all things, again, that you would learn in the course or you can look up yourself. So that is something that is crucial. The fact that only two of you got that right is quite concerning. Um, I really, really hope that you will leave today and memorize your brachial plexus chart. Super, super important to know. Let's see if anyone can answer this question. After an injury to C5, C6, which muscle would least likely be affected? Now, for those of you who have answered, I would love you to go to the chat box and just let us know why. <clears throat> Good, about 30 more seconds and just write your answers in the chat box. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, see how many people got it right there. So again, a little bit more of you this time. So about half of you got this right, oh, 60%, uh, which is flexor carpi ulnaris. I'm going to take a look in the chat and see who responded here. Uh, Lila, yes, perfect. And that's because the ulnar nerve innervates the flexors in that C8 to T1. So good job. Really happy to see you answer that correct. So again, things that we really want to see is we want to see you guys get these questions right. Um, it's a little bit higher knowledge to think about the innervations um, that we kind of take a little bit more into account like what comes up the posterior cord or what may not be affected but again only level two so all of you guys should be answering that correct okay so we're gonna keep going here <clears throat> so the next thing that we are going to chat about just gonna make sure I share my screen with you guys um, is pes anserine bursitis so Uh, hopefully this looks okay on your screen. It just got a little funky on me. We'll do it one more time. Okay. Uh, if, if people can't see it properly on the screen, just let me know. Uh, but the next thing that we are going to talk about is, again, no more than just basic anatomy. So, pes anserine bursitis. So, another common bursitis location is what we call pes anserine. Now, you should all know that pes anserine is that goose foot location. So, meaning there are a few muscles that go in, inner, or go in insert onto the medial aspect of the knee. Now, these three muscles are sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus. So, again, taking it to the next level, if maybe we did a level two question, I would ask you guys, between which two muscles does the bursa lay? Okay, and I'm going to get you guys to put that in the chat box for me. Again, the question is between which two muscles does the bursa lay? We'll just go with the first person to give us. Okay, uh, between gracilis and semi-ten. Yes, perfect. So if we take a look at the slide here, it was right in front of you guys. The answer is it's between this lovely semi-tendinosis and gracilis. So gracilis being on top, bursa deep to that would be semi-tendinosis. Okay, does everyone get that? Does that make sense? Not getting a lot of people in the chat, so hopefully it is making sense to you guys. But if we keep going then, my next point that I want you guys to learn about is understand more than just basic pathologies. So you need to integrate your knowledge. You need to know key features of pathologies as well as how you are going to integrate that knowledge into practice. Okay, so one of our examples that I want to give you here is piriformis syndrome. Uh, I just want to make sure that we have everyone uh, with us right now. So if um, you're following along, just give me a little thumbs up or a happy face or something in the chat so I know that we have people listening. Maria, nice to see you again. Perfect. Okay, everyone's here. Just a little quiet. That's okay. 
Uh, okay, so we're going to go on, as I said, and we're going to talk about this piriformis syndrome. Um, can everyone see the screen okay? It looks like it's just a little bit out of whack, but hopefully everyone's good with it. Okay, perfect. So, with piriformis syndrome, I'm going to get you guys to be a little bit more interactive here, and I want you to write some things in the chat box. So, I want you to tell me um, which of the following primary or secondary piriformis syndrome is due to an anatomical cause. Primary. Good job. Okay. Leela, as much as I appreciate you answering, I'm going to get you to not answer the next question just so we can have um, some other people who are not in the course to um, give us a bit of knowledge here. So yes, the primary piriformis syndrome is um, an anatomical cause, and it's because in approximately 85% of people, the piriformis muscle lays over top of the sciatic nerve. In the remaining, there's about 15% uh, of that remaining, the nerve pierces, splits, or surrounds the piriformis muscle. So these patients are more commonly to suffer from piriformis syndrome. Now, secondary piriformis syndrome is more often caused by microtrauma, and I'm going to bring us to the next slide here so you guys can see this. So it's more co often caused by microtrauma um, to the buttocks, leading to that muscle spasm, swelling, or nerve compression. So microtrauma can lead to nerve compression through overuse patterns or direct compression, um, such as, for example, someone having their wallet in their pocket. So I want you guys to help me out here. And which one is more common, do you think, primary or secondary piriformis syndrome? <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to wait for someone to answer me. Which is more common, primary or secondary piriformis syndrome? Okay, primary. Um, I'm going to ask for one of you guys to let me know why you think that. <clears throat> Okay, so we had someone else chime in and say secondary. So it looks like there may be a little bit of confusion with this. So can anyone give me um, a little bit more of a reason as to why you would think it would be primary or secondary? Okay, let's take a look here. So, hypertrophy of a muscle causing impingement. Um, secondary is only five, uh, 15, yes, is a, um, the population are able to have primary. Okay, so that is the correct answer. So, good job, Leela. <laughs> um, if we take a look at this, really what we want to see is we want to see that you guys are, again, integrating that knowledge. So that slide is up on your screen, and you should be able to just read through that and understand a little bit more than just kind of basic anatomy. So if we take a look at this, it's saying that, okay, uh, the anatomical cause is in primary, meaning that 85% of people have normal anatomy, but there's 15% of the population that could potentially have this abnormal um, and anatomical cause. Versus with secondary, it's caused from microtraumas or macrotrauma. It could be anything. It could be just, you know, overuse. It could be repetitive use. It could be compression. Um, so the, the population of people that could get secondary is a lot higher than only 15% of the population who potentially potentially could get primary. So the answer there is secondary. Secondary piriformis syndrome is more common. Okay? I hope everyone understands that. Next, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the different types of microtrauma. And I could ask you a, a little bit more of a difficult question and say, um, what type of nerve compression would you see in someone who uh, was sitting on their wallet? So again, Leela, I'm going to you not to answer this for me, um, and I just want you guys to write what type of nerve compression this is.
No idea. Okay, what about if I gave you guys a few ideas like neuropraxia, axonotomesis, or neurotomesis? Does that help? Neuropraxia. Good job. Okay, so the answer here is neuropraxia, and that is that transient loss of uh, muscle use, and it's usually due to compression. It usually doesn't last that long, um, and it goes away. So it, it, it has a complete recovery, meaning that if you sat on your wallet, it gives you temporary loss of function, but it's totally reversible. You may sometimes see it happen for longer periods of time, like six to nine weeks, but it should go back, okay? Uh, question, does valerian degeneration occur with someone sitting on their wallet? Harder questions. Again, guys, we're getting into more level three. So valerian generation does not occur. Good. And that's um, because recovery does not involve the actual regeneration. It's frequently involved more of the motor sensory function. Okay? So good job. No, not something that we need to worry about. But again, a way that they could ask you this question a little differently. So next we're going to go into Q-angle. Q-angle is a big compounding factor for getting piriformis syndrome. And if you look at the Q-angle, we'll take a look at the angle between what? So help me out here, guys. What angle are we looking at? Okay, so just for the sake of time, I'm going to work with you guys through this one. Um, I'm going to just throw this out there that I really do hope that everyone um, is maybe at the start of their studying um, or maybe you just haven't been studying the right things, but there's some key things you guys are missing here and I really, really hope um, that you can kind of amp up your studying because these are the type of questions that you're going to see, okay? So the Q angle is made by connecting a point near the ASIS to the midpoint of the patella, okay? Now we normally see that um, about 13 and a half plus or minus is considered normal, okay, for subjects between the age of you know, almost 18 to 35. Um, the Q angle is usually greater in who? Men or female? And I want you guys to get this. It should be 100%. Everyone, easy, easy, easy anatomy. Good. Female. So the Q angle is usually 4.6 degrees greater than that for men due to the presence of a wider pelvis increased antiversion and relative knee valgus angle, okay? So again, level one is me saying to you guys that the Q, what is uh, the Q angle or how is it created? So the axis is made uh, from the point near the A uh, ASAS to the midpoint of the patella. <clears throat> if I were to ask you who is more common to have a wider Q angle, again, very, very level one. I should say female. If I took it to level two, I would say, why is this? And you should easily be able to say that it is because of the wider pelvis, the increased antiversion, and relative knee valgus angle. Okay? That's a little bit more level two, but again, still quite easy. So I want you guys to pick up the studying. It needs to be a little bit more than what you're putting in right now. Okay. So if we keep going then, we can look at the piriformis syndrome signs and symptoms. Now, for the sake of time, I think we're going to go past this here, um, and we're going to go and go to point number four, okay? So point number four for me is I want you to compare and contrast similar pathologies. So what do I mean by that? Pretty much what I'm trying to get you guys to do is try to group or cluster pattern pathologies. Our brain naturally finds patterns. We work well by recognizing patterns. So I want you to start doing this when you study. <clears throat> so let's work together here and let's think of what is similar to carpal tunnel. What are some pathologies that the Alliance could confuse you with or even in your day-to-day -day, uh, you think is a differential diagnosis for carpal tunnel? Okay, again, this should be really easy. Good, thoracic outlet syndrome. So, we should know that one of the differential diagnoses for carpal tunnel is thoracic outlet syndrome. So, when you're studying and when you have your books in front of you, I want you guys to make a chart of signs and symptoms for carpal tunnel syndrome, different tests that you would use, different symptoms, different advice you would give, different homework or education you would give to them for carpal tunnel versus thoracic outlet. Okay, let's go to the next one. Chronic bronchitis. What would your answer be for that? What's something similar that you could compare and contrast with chronic bronchitis?
Emphysema, perfect. <laughs> Lila, you're making, you're making us look good at least. So yes, emphysema, that's a good one to put up against chronic bronchitis. Again, look at what the FEV1 is, look at the ratios, look at what their force vital capacity. Um, I'm just seeing someone just moment, I need to go back to work, I've tended this through my mobile. Okay, no problem, I'm really happy that you were able to join us. Have a great day at work. Uh, everyone else, we will keep going. Sorry, I know we're going a little bit late, um, but we'll keep going. So, new more thorax. Another one I want you guys to put up and compare and contrast. So, due to the sake of time, I'm going to give you the answer to this one. So, something you could put up against this would be attention, pneumothorax. A great way to know where are you going to get the medial sinal shift. Is it towards or is it away with pneumothorax versus attention pneumothorax? Okay, neurodegenerative diseases. Now, I tell all patients that they need, or patients, I tell everyone a patient, I tell my students um, that they need to make a chart for neurodegenerative diseases, okay? So when you're making this chart up, I want you to say, is it ascending? Is it descending weakness? Is it central paralysis? Is it peripheral paralysis? Are you getting symmetrical or asymmetrical syndromes? Is it chronic or are you gonna die from it? And how are you gonna die with this? What age does it start to present with? So neurodegenerative diseases, a good one to think of would be what? There's kind of my hallmark three that I get my students to make sure they absolutely know. ALS, Parkinson's, MS. Perfect. That's exactly it. So those are the big three that I want you guys to put up against each other, okay? So ALS, Parkinson's, um, and MS. All right. So hopefully everyone's keeping up with us here. We're going pretty fast. Uh, so the next thing that we're going to chat about here <clears throat> is carpal tunnel, but we're going to go past this a little bit. Um, I just want to see how or where we're at as far as knowledge-wise go. This is more of a level two question, but what area of the hand still remains normal sensation in carpal tunnel syndrome? Anyone? Leila, if you know, you can you can answer. The palm, yeah, good job. Okay, so the reason for that, if we take a look at the palmar cutaneous branch, uh, you'll see a few things here. So hopefully you can see my um, cursor on the screen. Do you guys see that? So um, the palmar cutaneous sensory branch of the nerve comes out before it goes through this carpal tunnel. So we do get that innervation to the palm um, despite having a disruption to the fingers, okay? Again, there's lots of questions we can ask with this. We can ask what type of um, ischemia are they getting with this? Which nerve is affected? What, where are they going to see atrophy here? Um, we could ask questions like what are the signs and symptoms? Um, what are special tests to treat it with? We could ask you to compare and contrast to get thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, we could ask you what comprises a thoracic outlet. So again, all things that you need to know. And, and I mean, I only have you know, 30 to 35 minutes with you now, but again, things that if you were taking a course, you would absolutely know and memorize, okay? Um, I want you guys to know what shortening or what contracture would cause things to pull. So we, I need you to know that shortening the scalings pulls the first ribs closer to the clavicle, resulting in that compression of nerves. Pec, pec minor tightness could do this too, and I could go further on and ask you questions like, where does the pec minor attach? Uh, the answer everyone should know is to the coracoid. What else attaches to the coracoid? There are three main things that attach to the coracoid. So again, we really, really want to make sure that this is easy, easy level one for you, so when you sit down and take your exam, it's easy to differentiate between A and B or C or D, okay? So again, knowing your tests for thoracic outlet, making sure you know your adsins, allens, military. All right. Point number five. I have two more points to go through, so stay stay with me if you can. Um, so my point number five is practice vignette style multiple choice questions. Okay, very very important. What is a vignette style question? And that is a paragraph with two to five follow up questions. Now due to timing today, I did not give you any vignette style questions. But if you guys stick around afterwards um, till the end, I am going to make sure that I just uh, send you guys out some. Okay, so. 
In order to practice these advanced style questions, I want you to look at keywords in the questions. Does it say not? No. Does it say not? Does it say best? Does it say least? Circle those and make sure you understand what it's asking you. Okay? So does it ask for signs and symptoms or does it just ask for one? Know the difference between what is a sign and what is a symptom. What is dizziness versus what is your actual reported blood pressure? Know that a sign is your actual recorded blood pressure. Know that your symptom is dizziness. And if it's just asking for a sign, then make sure you only give the answer that's a sign. And that's a great way that they can trick you. Does it ask for risk factors of a disease or a person um, kind of a specific risk factor? Okay. If so, look at the vignette and keep it patient specific. <clears throat> so my next one, number six, is practice like you play. When working through questions, mimic the exam scenario. So remember back to the very start when I said, put on some classical music into your headphones. Well, when you're actually practicing your vignette style questions, please do not do this. No headphones, don't go to the bathroom, don't have any food, don't take breaks, and limit water before. Try to get up really early, get up at 7 a.m. and write this exam because that's what you're going to be doing on the day of the exam. Work your way up to 200 questions, start with 100 questions, then go to 200 questions, okay? Use these questions as a way to really monitor how you're doing. What does your progress look like? Now, we do offer vignette style questions. We offer 100 or 200 options. Um, and you can really kind of use the score on this to see how you're doing. Now, our vignette style questions that you take online, you'll answer the question and then it'll give you a full feedback of why the question is right and why the, why the wrong questions are wrong. So very, very detailed. You get a long time to do it. Um, so it's a little, it's nice you can kind of hunker down and really make sure that you're understanding why the questions are the way they are. Um, so that's a great way to practice. But your score is gonna tell you a lot. So once you have your score, sorry, once you have your score, you can use this as a self-assessment tool. So if you are getting 75% um, or more on our mock exams, we deem you as competency reached, meaning you are ready to write the exam. If you're between 65 and 75%, we say studying and following up with a mock exam with tutoring or potentially just doing more questions or just keep studying because you're just not there. If you get under 65%, we highly recommend taking a course. Uh, you are not there. Your competency level has not been reached. And if you are around four to six months um, out from a course and you're scoring less than 40%, that's a good time to take a course. If you're anything within four to six months, you need to defer your exam. Okay, so for everyone who has signed up for exams, I'm not sure when you are writing, um, but what we really do want to see is if you're looking to do um, the March exam at this point, we would be expecting you to get over 65% on those exams. Okay, so bonus tip, who should take a course? Those who scored less than 65% students, if you're on your third attempt, you need to take a course. You don't have an option. This is your last chance to be a physiotherapist in Canada. So don't play with this attempt. If you need help focusing or if you've been out of school for a long time or if there's just too many books and you don't know what to use, okay? So the bonus tip here, we're, we're well over our time. So if anyone has to leave, I totally understand. But I'm going to chat with you a little bit about what our courses entail. So our courses for the written exam are a two-month course. There are eight virtual sessions and you get two vignette style mock exams. So a very comprehensive look at the material. You also get two mock exam review sessions. So meaning you meet with your tutor and you go through commonly incorrect answered questions on that mock exam and we find out what you need to improve on. In our courses, there are no more than three students to one teacher in a course, which is really, really important. And I really you know, commend us that we're the most comprehensive course. And on top of that, we have one of the, we do have the lowest student to teacher ratio. You're not gonna get 20 students in a course, you're getting three, okay? You also get a course manual. And this course manual has been 
a saving grace for a lot of people out there. We have a lot of students asking us if they can just have the course manual. We don't sell it as an individual booklet. We do require you to take the course because we don't think the booklet, um, you know, does enough justice. But we really do think that that course manual is how you need to study and prepare for this exam. So, uh, let's assume that you guys are writing in March. What we would tell people to do is, say you were to sign up, let's go for easy sake, um, October 31st. That would mean that you have approximately 60 to 65 days before your course starts. Our courses from March start in January. So if you did sign up within the next week, what would happen then is you would take 300 pages divided by 65 days. Um, that would give you about four to five pages that you would be reviewing each day, okay? If, for example, you get to a section and you think, I'm not really sure what I need to be doing here, uh, or I'm not really sure that I have a full understanding, or I really wish there was a little bit more information, that's when you use your other textbooks. So, for example, we do a really good um, section on postural drainage, why you're doing it, the purpose of VQ matching. However, if you got to the end of that and you thought, you know what, my knowledge is not quite complete, or I don't feel like I could explain this to someone else, then that's when you would go and use Reed and Chung and really make sure you understand what VQ matching is. But we really encourage our students to use that course manual to the best of your ability. Make sure you have read it and memorized, and our students who do that are successful on the exam. The other thing about our courses is that you do get unlimited support, meaning that you can email us at any time, you can set up meetings at any time, so you will always have support. Uh, if you do sign up and take a course early, so some people are taking, um, for example, the, um, like the September exam, they're still taking an early course, and that's because we will help you afterwards. You're not just left high and dry. Here is an example of one of our course schedules. So um, this is back in um, June, but this is what it looks like. You're going to go over lower extremity MSK, upper extremity MSK, cardio arrest, your review, MSK neuro. You can see all of this on our website. So you go to ptprep.ca and you can take a look at all of our courses for the written exam. We are full for starts in October, November, and December. Our next intake is in January, okay? We have a 90% pass rate, which we're very, very proud of, and this is for students who attend all sessions and take our advice on things to change, okay? Um, all of our educators are trained in Canada, meaning they've done their bachelor's and master's in physiotherapy in Canada. 